This is work with three of my colleagues, Martin Casado. I've put in bold because he's really the inventor of software-defined networking as we know it. Out, as we now know it. Um, Nick McCune, you probably all know, has been involved in software-defined networking from the very beginning, has been leading the open flow development and standardization efforts. And Tamo Kaponen, who knows Tamo Kaponen here? He is the best internet architect in the world by a significant margin. So you should go find out, go look at what he's written. He's also been involved in software-defined networking from the very beginning. Now, there are many other people who have been involved in software-defined networking. This talk will reflect my discussions with three colleagues I've listed who I've been very lucky to have a chance to work with. But Jen Rexford, foremost among them, who will be giving a talk, I believe, tomorrow afternoon, has been very instrumental in developing software-defined networking. Nick Feimster and many other people have been involved. So by not listing their names here, I don't mean they haven't been involved in software-defined networking. They just bear no responsibility for the talk that's to follow, for which I think they are grateful. Now let me start with a, a few comments. First of all, I have a startup in this area, so you can disbelieve anything I say, but I am here in my role as, as a professor. Second, in talking to Danny, I was given the impression that most of you, the vast majority of you, don't know SDM. Obviously, some of you do. Some of you know much more than I do. So I am pitching this as a basic introduction. For those of you who already know some of SDN, you know, enjoy your nap. I'll wake you up when, when I'm done. And this is going to be a gentle introduction. I will give you cliff notes. I will tell you when to wake up, and I'm going to give you four points. That's all you need to remember. Okay? Now, I want to lower your expectations right now. Software-defined networking is not a revolutionary technology. We don't make, in contrast to the previous two talks, we don't make bits go faster. We don't do magical things with them. It's an organizing principle. That's all it is. It's an organizing principle. So prepare to be underwhelmed. And I'm going to use an incredibly pretentious mechanism here in that I'm going to ask myself questions and then answer them. Now, that's not just because I'm comparing myself to Socrates. It is because the rationale behind SDN is much more important than its design. If you get hung up on its design, you're missing the point. The point is, what questions is it answering? And that's what I want to get across by the way I'm structuring the talk. Before starting off, let me give you a short history of software-defined networking. In around 2004, starting largely with Jen Rexford on the Route Control Platform Project, then burgeoning into the 4D Project, and also Stanford and Berkeley's work on SANE and Ethane, there was this early work on sort of new ways of managing networks. In 2008, the sort of software-defined networking elements that we come to know it, sort of the Knox network operating system and the open flow switch interface that I'll talk about later, were defined. Three short years later, the Open Networking Foundation, that's a nonprofit that Nick McEwen and I set up to be the standards body, the IETF of software-defined networking, has a board made up of very big companies who use a lot of networking equipment. It has essentially everybody who's involved in networking as a member. So this is a dramatic in three short years. And then this, just I guess this past April, we had the latest Open Networking Summit. This is the interop of software-defined networking, sort of a trade show, an engineering meeting. We had about 1,000 engineers there. Google publicly announced that they interconnect their data centers using SDN. So Google's WAN is, if you count in terms of bits, probably the largest in the world and it is in production running on this new technology. So SDN is now commercial. It is in production use. It's not widely in production use. Google's way ahead of most places. But so the question that you ought to be asking yourself now is why the rapid acceptance? Sort of new networking technologies like this take forever. IPv6? You know, so why this? So it must be answering some important question. So what is that question? So to answer a question with a question, I'm going to start off, we're going to start back at the beginning and ask a basic one, which is how do we build large-scale software systems? So how many people of here have heard Barbara Liskoff's Turing Award lecture? It is absolutely brilliant. Go, it's on YouTube all over the place. Go listen to it. But she sums up computer science in one sentence, which is modularity based on abstraction is the way things get done. That's just you want to build a large system. That's the only trick we have. And what she means is you take abstractions, 
You use them to define the relevant interfaces. And then you end up with a modular system. And so what does a modular system give you? You can reuse your code. You have freedom of implementation. You can change the implementation as long as you don't change the interfaces. No other code needs to change. And you get to separate the concerns. So abstractions are great. But how do you come up with abstractions? How do you come up with an abstraction when you're faced with a problem? Well, abstractions are nothing more than problem decomposition. That you start by subdividing your problem into components or tasks. You then define an abstraction for each one of them. And then you implement that abstraction, only paying attention to having to support that interface. And then if you're not able to do this, you go back to step one and you figured out that you got the wrong abstractions because the tasks weren't easy enough. So that's how you find abstractions as you start subdividing the problem. So what abstractions have been applied to networking? So to answer that, we first need to recognize that there are two different planes in networking. There's the data plane. This is about forwarding packets. Packet arrives at a switch. You look at its packet header, you look at the forwarding state in the switch, you do some magic and you ship it out. You decide which port, you decide whether or not to drop it. That's the data plane. It's taking the packet header and the forwarding state and making a decision. It has to go really fast. In addition, there's the control plane. The control plane is what puts the forwarding state there. You can compute it using distributed algorithms, you can compute it Using centralized algorithms, you can have it manually configured. It doesn't matter how it gets there. It's still part of the control plane. So there's the data plane and the control plane. They're very different. And so they're going to have different abstractions. So what abstractions do we have for the data plane? So this picture ought to be familiar. It's the layers. Those are the abstractions. Now, people say, oh, yeah, layering. This is why the internet succeeded, because they absolutely nailed the data plane abstractions. You build applications. You build it on reliable transport. That's an end-to-end -end reliable transport. You build reliable transport on best effort global packet delivery. You build global best effort packet delivery on local best effort packet delivery. And then you build that on top of physical delivery of bits. Each is a separate problem you can build on top of the layer below. Absolutely nailed it. So these are the abstractions we have in the data plane. It's incredibly successful. Hasn't really been changed since it was first defined. What about the control plane? What abstractions do we have in the control plane? Anybody? Good question. What abstractions do we have in the control plane? So we have lots of mechanisms in the control plane, and they do lots of different things. They do routing. So we have you know, a whole family of distributed routing algorithms, OSPF and ISIS and shortest tree, you know, sort of all sorts of things. We have isolation. So we have ACLs. We have VLANs. We have firewalls. And you have traffic engineering and all sorts of mechanisms for traffic engineering. So you have lots of mechanisms that are trying to affect the routing, the forwarding state. But the problem is there is no modularity. And there's limited functionality. So if any student ever questions you about why you care about abstractions, you should point out that the network control plane is what happens when you have mechanism without abstractions. You end up with too many mechanisms and not enough functionality. Because every new problem, you have to define a whole mechanism from scratch. And the fact that it means you have to do it from scratch means you don't do a very good job of it. And then the next problem comes along, and you do another mediocre job. And that's the control plane we have today. So that's how we did it wrong. How should we do it right? What abstractions should we use in the control plane? So how do you find abstractions? You do it by decomposing the problem. So what problem is the control plane trying to solve? The control plane is designed to compute the forwarding state under three constraints. It's got to do it consistent with a particular low-level hardware and software, meaning that you need to know what the ASIC is in order to, to put that forwarding state in. You need to know what that hardware and software are doing in the switch. You need to base it, if you're doing something like routing, on the entire network topology. 
and you need to insert that forwarding state into every single physical forwarding box in the network. You have to configure every single box. Okay. So this is what the control plane does. And so we view this as a community as natural. And so when we have to design a new protocol, we say, okay, fine, how do we solve these three problems? If there is one thing you remember from this talk, it is on the next slide. This is absolutely nuts. And let me convince you why. Let's take a programming analogy. Let's say you were told to write a program. You had to be aware of the hardware you were running on, and you had to specify where every bit was stored. If you were a programmer, what would you say? You'd say, forget it, that's ridiculous. First, give me an abstraction that's a virtual memory abstraction, so I don't have to worry about where the memory is being stored. And then give me some kind of operating system that covers up the details of the hardware. Then I'll write your program. But I'm not going to worry about those low-level details. That's for somebody else. That's for infrastructure to take care of. So programmers use abstractions to separate concerns so you don't have to solve everything from scratch. We've never done that in networking. We do it all ourselves every time. And so that's what we should do, is follow those abstractions. So what are the abstractions that you would need for the control plane? So the first you need, the requirement is you need to be compatible with low-level hardware and software. So what we need is some abstraction that will hide the details of low-level hardware and software, some kind of general forwarding model. You need to make decisions based on the entire network. And that involves a lot of complicated mechanisms trying to get that state. So you need some abstraction that will hide that and just give you the network state. And you need an abstraction that will make it easier to configure the network so you don't have to actually configure every physical box. So the control plane needs three abstractions. So I'm going to go through them, each one, and talk a little bit more detail about what they'll be. So for the forwarding abstraction, the whole idea is you want to hide the details. You want to express your intent of what you want to have happen to packets without worrying about whether it's a Juniper box or a Cisco box or what ASIC they've got. OpenFlow is the current proposal to do that. All you need to know about OpenFlow is that it's sort of a standard interface to a switch so that you can access the switch and that you can store flow entries. And the flow entries are the form of a packet header, template, and an action. It says if the packet matches this template, do this action. So like if this is its destination address, then drop it or forward it out this port or something. And so it's merely an interface where you can tell the switch what to do. You don't care how its ASIC is implemented. It's this general language that every switch has to understand. Now that sounds conceptually incredibly simple, and it is. The details get into exactly what header matchings do you allow, is that consistent with the way most ASICs are designed, and so on and so forth. So Defining the details of OpenFlow are hard, but the conceptually, it's very easy. What about the network state abstraction? What you want to do is abstract away all the complicated distributed algorithm that goes into getting this global state. Instead, you just want an abstraction that says, here's the global network view. That is, you want to give a graph, an annotated graph, annotated with things like you know, the delay or the capacity or maybe even the recent loss rate. So you have this graph. And so you can make decisions about what you want to do on the network based on this graph. And then it's an API. You can actually program and tell the switches what to do. The way it's implemented, and I'll describe this in a tiny bit more detail in the following slide, is something we call a network operating system. A network operating system runs on servers in the network. So you've just put up some standard issue servers, they're running the software, it's replicated for reliability, and the information flows both ways. That is, these servers talk to all the switches, they get a map of the network, and then when they're told by the control program what they want the switches to do, they go and they tell the switches what to do. Okay. So, enough words, time for a few pictures. So, this is network switches and routers, the old style design, has them each talking to each other in a standard sort of peer-based routing algorithm. 
where they are doing some complicated distributed algorithm. It is task specific. Like if you take a standard shortest path routing algorithm and I tell you, no, now I want you to compute three path disjoint, disjoint paths. You can't just sort of change a few tweaks in the algorithm. You have to redesign the algorithm. So we want to replace this with a general purpose system. This is software running on some servers, but it talks to each of the switches, finds out the topology. That presents a global network view. And then you write your control program on top of that global network view. And that control program could be routing, could be access control, could be traffic engineering, whatever it is you're trying to do. So this is a major change in the paradigm. The control program now, the way you control the network, is now the configuration. That means the sort of the forwarding entries I'm putting into the routers is a function of this global view. It's a function of the graph. So the control mechanism is a program using an API. It is not a distributed protocol. It is a graph algorithm. You just look at a graph and you figure out if you want k-disjoint path, that's fine. You just go dig out an algorithm and you run it. Because it's all centralized. The data is right there in your hands. You don't have to distribute anything. So that's much easier to deal with than redesigning a distributed protocol every time you want to do something different. So this has been a very fast introduction into sort of the, the basic of SDM. But notice I said there were three abstractions, and I've only used two. So what's the third abstraction? It's the specification abstraction. Remember that what I just described had to go and put in forwarding state into every single switch and router. That is, your control program had to dictate what the flow entries were everywhere. But the control program, its job is to express the desired behavior. Meaning, like, if you wanted to do access control and you don't want A to talk to B, your control program's got to tell you that. The network has no idea whether A should talk to B. The control program has to tell you that. But the control program should not be responsible for implementing the statement A should not talk to B. That's going to require detailed configuration along every router along the path. And so our proposed abstraction is that rather than making the control program deal with the actual full network topology, you give it an abstract graph, a graph with many fewer details that only has enough details so that you can specify your goals. And how much detail will depend on what you're trying to do, whether it's quality of service or traffic engineering or access control. And the way to think about this, this is like programming in compilers, right? You're writing a program and you're running on an x86. Eventually, it will be reduced to the x86 instruction set. But just because that's where we end up doesn't mean we tell the programmer, OK, well, give me the instructions. We say, write in a high-level language, and then we'll have a compiler that will then go and turn it into x86 instructions. But you, the programmer, only have to worry about this high-level language. We're doing the same thing here. Only worry about this high-level view. And so let me give you an example, because I'm sure this has not been very clear. Here is a faithful network view. This is the real topology. We've got A over there. We've got B over here. Our application is access control. The control program doesn't want A to talk to B. So you could say, OK, the control program has to go and figure out how to do routing and then put in the access control lists in the right places so A can't possibly talk to B. Or you could say, that's the view you give the control program. You say, here, here are all the external interfaces on your network. Who do you want to be able to talk to who? The control program says, don't let A talk to B. And the control program is done. It is now part of the compiler to make sure that you take this picture and you put in the ACLs in the right place. Because the intent has been specified. The rest is just mechanics. So what that means is we go back to our software-defined networking picture, and we insert a new layer. So we stick in a virtualization layer, which now presents an abstract network view to the control program. So the control program sees a very simple network. It tells that network what it wants to have happen, like 
blocking traffic and so forth. The virtualization layer then converts that to the global network view, which it hands off to the network operating system, which talks to the switches. So this is a completely clean separation of concerns. The control program has one job. That is to express the operator's requirements. That's the only, only, only thing it has to worry about, is what does the operator want to have happen? And I will tell the network that. The virtualization layer says, OK, I will take that, those commands based on this simplified network view, and I will translate to what it means on the actual physical topology. Then the network operating system takes those commands on the, the, sort of the topology and then actually transmits them to the physical switches. And in return, if there's a change in the physical topology, we'll reflect that up, which then travels up to the abstract view if necessary. So each one of these pieces has a well-defined piece of the puzzle. And so what we have defined now, these are layers for the network control plane. Just like the data plane had layers, now the network control plane has layers. It's each got a very well-identified task. One of the things to keep in mind is that abstractions don't eliminate complexity. They just move it around. So every component of the system that I just described is tractable. But the virtualization layer and the network operating system layer, those are complicated pieces of code. Those are not simple to get right. So what is SDN's achievement if it's not to eliminate complexity? It is to put it in the right place. That is, it simplifies the interface to the control program so the control program now has a very simple job, which is specify why we want to have happen on a very simple network. The complicated part of the job is in the reusable code. So this depends on what the user wants. You have to rewrite it. This is part of the SDN platform. You get to reuse it. That's where all the complication goes. So this is just like compilers. Compilers are hard to write. They're hard to debug. But once you get them right, everybody else benefits. And that's all we're doing here. We're putting in layers that essentially are network compilers that let you state what you want to have happen at a very high level and make sure the network does the right thing. So for, for those of you who have struggled to get your favorite ideas adopted in the internet, you will know that just because something is a good idea isn't enough to get it deployed. There's got to be a killer app. There's got to be something that people want. And so, you know, I learned in my few years at, at the company when I was the founding CEO, the difference between a good idea and a killer app is a good idea, people say, that's great, I'll take it in my lab and let me test it out. A killer app is, I don't care if it works, I need it now. And that, what is that killer app that is making SDN get adopted so fast? Something that was echoed in the previous two talks, but not quite so explicitly, is that in today's network, topology is policy. What I mean by that is where you place your routers, where you place your firewalls, that dictates what your broadcast domains are, that dictates how effective your ACLs are, that is, ACLs can only catch the packets that travel through on that path. So if you have the topology, that dictates largely what the policy is. Now, when you are moving your network to the cloud, you would like to keep that policy the same. That policy you have so lovingly tendered and gotten sure that you got all the security right and so forth. But very few network operators have an abstract expression of network policy. They don't have an algebra that describes who can talk to who. They have a network topology. So what SDN allows you to do is specify this logical topology to the cloud. It says, this is the topology of my network. And what the cloud does using SDN, it ignores the actual physical topology. It says that is a policy statement, i.e. there's a router here, so broadcast packets should be stopped here. There's a firewall with an ACL here in this logical topology. So that means wherever I put it in the cloud, I need to make sure there's an ACL on the path. So all you need to do is embed in the cloud the correct policy. 
And that's actually easy because that you can read the policy out of the topology. So you use topology as a policy statement and you replicate the policy. And it means you can migrate seamlessly. You can take a VM that's in your home network, move it to the cloud and back, and the same policy requirements will apply because it's in the same virtual topology. This is what people are paying money for. They couldn't do it with any other topology. They can do it at the end, and that's why they're using it right now. This is the killer app. So, what should you remember? about SDN. So here are the four points. <clears throat> One, SDN is merely a set of abstractions for the control plane. It is not a specific set of mechanisms. You can implement SDN in a whole bunch of ways. And in particular, you should be careful about getting too caught up in the mechanism. Many people confuse OpenFlow with SDN. In terms of the architecture I've laid out here, OpenFlow is no more important than the x86 instruction set. Nobody cares whether we use x86, well, I'm sorry, Intel, if you're in the audience, but nobody actually cares what the instruction set is as long as it's reasonably good, right? You have a compiler, who cares? The same thing with OpenFlow. Who actually cares what it is in detail as long as it just doesn't get in your way? What OpenFlow is important is it changes the industry structure because it gives you an open interface to somebody's box. So architecturally, it's boring. In terms of the overall industry structure and business models, it's very interesting. SDN involves a function, not a distributed protocol, a function. The network operating system is what handles all the distribution. So SDN involves computing a function. That function is evaluated on an abstract network. So for the first time, networking is now free of what the actual network looks like. We've been free of that in computing for a long time due to virtualization. Now, we don't actually care what the network topology is because we are computing this function on an abstract network and the compiler takes care of what the physical network looks like. And that network virtualization is the killer app. These are the four points you should remember about SDN. Everything else is a waste of time. And we should note that, so we've already virtualized storage and compute, so being able to virtualize the network is the last stage in actually freeing ourselves from physical realities. So, a question that, that I, is, is what I'm interested in about this is, aside from providing easier network management, which, to be quite honest, I don't care all that much about, um, but, the question is, how will SDN change networking as a whole? So let me go through this slowly and talk about four changes that I think SDN will bring about that have large ramifications for how networking will look. The first thing to notice is that it separates the control and the data planes. Right now, in current networks, the control plane and the data plane are tied together that the boxes that compute your routing state are the boxes that implement that routing state. So they are one in the same. Both they are the same in terms of vendors and they are both implemented in the same place. SDN pulls them apart because the network operating system runs on servers, it observes and controls the data plane, but it is not part of the data plane. So what this does is it changes the business model and the deployment model. You can buy the control plane from somebody different than you buy your switches from. That means commodity hardware, third-party software could be the way networks go. It also changes the testing model. Right now, how do you test large-scale networks? We buy a bunch of equipment, you put it into a humongous lab, and you have people unplugging wires and plugging them back in to try and simulate what a large network would do. Here, what you say is we have a clean interface that we know exactly how the hardware is supposed to behave because we've got an interface that all hardware is supposed to support. We do unit testing on the hardware to make sure that it does the right thing. And then we do simulations, large-scale simulations of the control plane that's in software. Much better testing than we can do today. And Google actually, when they made their announcement about using it to control their WAN, this was one of the major points was the much better testing of networks with this split architecture. The second point is that networking becomes edge-oriented. 
What do I mean by that? Most of the functionality people care about in networking, like access control, quality of service, mobility, migration, monitoring, and so forth, you can do at the edge. So the network core merely has to deliver packets edge to edge. Now, our current networking technologies are really good at that. We don't need to replace them. We can keep them the way they are. So we're going to let the hedge handle all the complexity. That is, if you have any fancy matching algorithms you want to do on packets in order to do bizarre actions on them, do it at the edge. So now all the functionality has moved essentially to the edge and sort of you, you, you run an overlay network essentially on the core of your network. So this has two important implications. One is it makes SDN incrementally deployable. That is, host software typically now has an open flow switch. There's something called Open vSwitch, which is an open source implementation of OpenFlow, plus plus. It's in Linux, it's in Zen. So typically, I mean, all packets are born in software. There is typically a switch, an open flow based switch in that same software. You can do your edge processing right there. So then all hardware switches are core switches. They don't need to do anything. The edge becomes a software switch. We can just upgrade through a, a software update on, on the host, which is software you control. Core of the network can be legacy hardware. Not only that, you can deploy SDN without even telling your network operators you're deploying SDN because it's all being done on the host. The network is still operating. The fact that packets are being tunneled through now, totally invisible. So this enables incremental deployment of SDN. You might never need to put OpenFlow in a hardware switch, ever. So one of the reasons it's being so rapidly adopted is that, you, you know, step one, replace all my switches. You don't need to do that. The second big change is that networking is becoming software oriented. All the complicated forwarding I just described as being done in an edge software switch. The control plane itself is a program running on a server, not some code running on a proprietary box. So we are now programming the network. We're not designing it. And what I mean by that is typically when we talk about designing the network is we'd sit down really hard, we'd figure out what the packet headers would look like and what the ASICs would have to do, and then that would stay constant for you know, somewhere between five and 30 years. Now we're writing a program. We're thinking about abstractions, modularity. We can change it whenever we want. It's a completely different exercise. So we're going to innovate at software speeds, not hardware speeds. Now, software has another property in that it lends itself to very clean abstractions because you can keep modifying the software until you get the abstractions right. So networking can, can become more formal. That is, because clean abstractions lead to increased rigor. You can make much cleaner statements about software when you get the abstractions right. So let me give you two examples of what we're able to do with SDN that we can't do with today's network. So in terms of clear reasoning. So if you were to design a system for a WAN controller, and this is a design that's very similar to something Jen's done, so I'm really covering both of our work here. You can design it in such a way, first of all, rather than a standard sort of you know, disinfect a routing algorithm, there, there is no iterative control, I mean iterative convergence. If a link fails, packet goes up, comes back down, you are recovered. End of story. So there's a bounded time. You might argue that OSPF can do that too, fine. The second thing that OSPF can't do is it's transactional. What that means is every packet either gets carried by the old state or the new state. You never have a packet that sort of gets halfway through the network and then is starting to be carried by new state when it started off being carried by old state. Why is that important? Because when you're changing from old state to new state, you might end up with loops during that convergence period here, no loops. Absolutely, it's just guaranteed right out of the box. It just won't happen. You can't say that about most modern routing algorithms. The second example is network troubleshooting. Um, I don't think there's anybody in the world who's happy with how hard it is to troubleshoot problems, particularly in a WAN setting. 
Um, it's very hard to understand why something has gone wrong. Well, here you have the advantage, first of all, that you have an expression of what you wanted to have happen at a very high abstract level. Current networks, what you want to have happen is, is, you know, what you have to do is you have to go read the assembly code, i.e. the flow entries to figure out what was trying to happen. Here you have a very high level expression. You can check the invariance when you go down the SDN stack and see where those invariants first got broken. Like let's say up at the top I say A can't talk to B. And you look down and you realize you know, when you see packets, you see packets getting from A to B. So what you do is you look at the control program and see where that invariant first got broken by looking at the flow entries at each level of abstraction. So then you've identified the layer where things have gone wrong. And then because you can then test this in software, you can actually run a sort of an algorithmic procedure that will identify the minimal causal set. And what I mean by that is that if A wasn't talking to B and then I had a couple of link failures and then all of a sudden I noticed A was talking to B, I can figure out which minimal set of link failures triggered the bug. So this is algorithmic. It doesn't take a, a, an operator being smart. We will just sort of say, boom, here is a level in software that's wrong, and here are the two link failures that if they happen within 30 milliseconds, trigger this bug. We can't go from there. You know, you got to go into a debugger to actually find the bug in the code, but that level of troubleshooting just is not available in networks today. So, you know, I don't think the most lasting legacy of SDN is that we're going to have data centers that behave better. I think the most lasting legacy is that we're going to have much better ways of reasoning about network control, and that's going to let us push networks into whole new arenas now that we understand them. So I want to finish my last slide by giving you what the SDN vision is. The SDN vision is not very ambitious. ambitious. It just wants networking to be normal. And what I mean by that, normal is, we want hardware to be cheap, follow Moore's law. We want software to have frequent releases to be decoupled from hardware. We want the functionality to be driven by software because you can innovate much more quickly. And we want it built on solid intellectual foundations. Every single area of computer science except for networking has been this way for a decade or more. Networking is not there now, but with SDN, that's where we will get. Thank you.